So, let's get busy. First thing I'm going to do is show you guys a comic strip. Does anyone know Calvin and Hobbes? Anyone? They're an American comic strip. So I'll give you two minutes to read the comic. You've got two minutes. Following the rules. 
And one of the rules in society is you shouldn't kill people. So for them, following the rule, not killing people, is the most important thing. Plus, in each society, there are certain cultural rules. How many people have seen the movie Titanic? So when the Titanic is sinking, one of the Western British cultural rules is women and children are rescued first. So, um, how many women in this room, females, hands up? You guys would go first. And how many boys are under 20? You would be classed as children in Japan. You would also go first. How many boys are over 20? Over 20. Sorry, you're men like me. We're last. That would be a kind of deontological cultural rule of Europe. Not now. But Asia is a little bit different. Confucian type cultural deontological values, they think old people are more important because of their wisdom. So who are the people over 20? Over 20? And me? We would go first under Asian cultural values. So the deontological thinking, it's about following what society says are the good rules. Now, if we rescue the women and the young men first and the old people last, and this takes time, maybe we still have around 20 people dying. But for deontological people, this is okay because we follow the rules. Now, another kind of thinking is rights ethics. Now, rights ethics means everybody is the same. We are all human, we are all alive, and we should all have the same choice. So, with the rights ethics, we would get everyone to write down their name on a piece of paper, give me the names, and I would, ah, Yuki Tanaka, you can go first. Ah, Taro Suzuki, you can go second. And so on, and so on, and so on. This would be 100% fair. It would be very slow. And maybe 70 people die. But it would be very fair. Everybody would be equal. That would be a kind of rights ethics. And the last one I'm going to talk about would be intuitionism. This is a kind of thinking like case by case basis. Now, here is the fire, the smoke from the fire, the heat from the fire is most dangerous for the people close to the fire. Intuition, hmm, they are closest to the fire, they should go first. The people who are at the very back, they are very, very far. They can wait until the end. Now, also intuitionism, how about sick people? Someone who has a bad leg, maybe cannot walk very fast. Maybe they would also go first. Now, there is a disease called asthma. It's a kind of breathing problem when people have stress. And if we have smoke, this is a very dangerous thing. So anyone who has asthma, even if they are sitting in the middle or the back, maybe also I would let them go first. That kind of case by case, my intuition. So these would be the four main types of ethical thinking. What I want you to do, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, think. Which of these four thinking is you? How do you think about ethics? Which one of these four is your kind of thinking? We have teleological. The end result is most important. How many people are teleological thinkers? Okay, there are a few hands going up. Maybe 5%. How many people are deontological thinkers following the rules? Again, about the same, maybe 5%, 10%. How 
How many are rights ethics people? We are all the same. Again, about 5, maybe 10%. And how many people are intuitionists? So far, most of you. Okay, let's have a look at something. I'm going to play you a short video. And this is a short video about ethics or the lack of ethics in business. At Multinational Honor, we put together a list of the top corporate criminals of the 1990s. We went back and looked at all of the criminal fines that corporations had paid in the decade. Exxon pled guilty in connection to federal criminal charges with the Valdez bill and paid $125 million in criminal fines. General Electric was guilty of defrauding the federal government and paid $9.5 million in criminal fines. Chevron was guilty of environmental violations and paid $6.5 million. Mitsubishi was guilty of antitrust violation and paid $1.8 million. IBM was guilty of illegal exports and paid $8.5 million. Was guilty of an environmental violation. Pfizer, the drug manufacturer, was guilty of antitrust violation and paid $20 million. The food and drug regulatory violation. Sears was guilty of financial fraud. Again and again, we have the problem that whether you obey the law or not is a matter of whether it's cost effective. If the chance of getting caught and the penalty are less than the cost to comply, uh, people think of it as being just a business decision. So what you can see here, these corporations did something which was not ethical because they could make a big profit and if they got caught, the penalty was low compared to the profit. So today, you guys have a quiz. Imagine if you could cheat on this quiz and you would get an A grade for the quiz, you would get an A grade for ARW, you would get an A grade for the whole year that I see you if you cheat. If you get caught, the A grade gets moved to an A minus grade. How many people would cheat? So we can see the honest students, at least the honest ones are down the front. <coughs> so this is the kind of thing. The ethics makes it easy for people to cheat if the penalty is not big. And here, for these corporations, although these numbers seem like big penalties, the profits is even higher. So they took the gamble to do the unethical behavior, and some of them get caught. Now that's corporations, because they always have to think about the money, 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 money. What I'm going to do for you guys now, I'm going to give you some ethical puzzles in twos or in threes that you're going to think about, but they don't involve money. This is a very famous problem called the trolley problem. And I want you to imagine you are Flanders, you are this guy, this is you. And there's a train, a tram car, and it's going straight and it's going to kill five people and a dog if you do nothing. But you have the power to flip the switch. If you flip the switch, the trolley goes this way and kills one person. You have the choice. Do nothing, five people, one dog, dead. Do something, flip the switch, Five people, one dog, alive, one person, dead. What do you want to do? In groups, twos, threes, four if you like, you want to chat with your partner? What do you want to do? What would you do? Flip the switch? Don't flip the switch. I'll give you two minutes. <laughs>
90% of people in the room would flick the switch. Flicking the switch is a teleological thing to do. But when I said, how many people were teleological? Only 5% said they were teleological thinkers. But here's a puzzle. And 40% of you are doing the teleological thing. When 35% of you said, I'm not teleological, I'm doing the teleological thing. That's a little bit strange. Okay? How many people would do nothing? Okay, about 40, maybe 50%. That means there's about 10 or 20%. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know is the same as doing nothing. Because you have to make the decision quick. Okay, let's change it. Same idea. You are Flanders again. If you do nothing, five people and the dog are dead. But if you push the fat man, he will fall, the train will hit the fat man, the fat man will die, the five people and the dog will live. What do you want to do? <laughs> Same thing again, in the groups. Yeah. <laughs> Is that any different? Yeah. In the groups, what do you want to do? Have you got one for these guys? person, 40% of you will do. Here, killing one person, only 10% will do. Why? How is this different from this? One person dead, five people and a dog okay. One person dead, five people and a dog okay. What's different? Any ideas? What's different? more direct. Here, this is kind of passive. I'm pushing a button. It's passive. Pushing a button. It's passive. Pushing a person is more active. So most people don't want to do the active thing, but they will do the passive thing. So more people would choose to kill one person here, but not here. Let's give you another one. This is you. If you do nothing, the train kills you. If you flip the switch, the train kills five people and a dog. What are you going to do? <laughs> and you're Switch. About 60, 70 percent. 
How many people will not flick the switch? About 20%. The heroes, 20%. Okay, let's change it, let's change it. This is still you. Do nothing, the train kills you. Flick the switch, the train kills five people and a dog. But before, you did not know those five people and a dog. Now, those five people and a dog, that's your family and your dog.
shield. Now this is about half of the room would pick up the baby as a shield. Now in war, sometimes a group of soldiers are going in to a certain area. And they know when they go in, maybe someone will shoot at them. So sometimes the soldiers take civilians, normal women, children, old people, and make them walk first. So they're kind of hiding behind, making a human shield. Under international law, the Geneva Conventions in War, this is totally illegal. Armies are not allowed to do this. It's a breach of international law. But 40 to 50 percent of you think this is okay. You would be breaking international law if you were a soldier and you did this. So there's a curious idea that 40 or 50 percent of the people in this room could be war criminals. Something to think about. Okay, let's move on to another one. Probably easier. This time, this is you. You are the guy with the gun. This is you. The bad guy, he is going to flip the switch. The train is going to change and the train is going to kill you. But you have a gun. If you shoot him first, the train will go straight and you will be safe. What are you going to do? Okay, let's take a vote. How many 
people would shoot much less than last time. Much less. Okay, one more. This is the last one. The last one. Here, you are the fat guy with the gun. You are the fat guy. You have the gun. The train is going to kill five people. This man is a teleological thinker. He wants to push you to kill you to save five people. And you are on the edge. If he pushes you, you will fall, you will die. But you have a gun. Will you shoot him to stop him pushing you off the bridge? What will you do? choosing to flip the switch, some of you not. And when you have choice, we can see here that not everybody's choosing the same thing. We're getting many, many, many different answers. So looking through all of these puzzles, let's go back. Now what I want you to do, now really thinking, how many of you are teleological thinkers? Probably more than last time. Okay, how many of you are deontological thinkers following the rules? Probably less than last time. How many are rights people? No one's saying rights. Um, how many are intuition? Again, still quite a lot. Okay, let's move on to our last problem. Come on. Stuck. Go through these. And this day, the mine is open to the public. Normal people can go down and have a look. But when they're under the ground, there's an earthquake. And the elevator gets broken. And these people are stuck. And under the ground, there is some water. And the water is coming through and getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. These people have a problem. They need to be rescued. And here is your group. And you guys have a rope. And you can rescue these people one by one by one by one. These are the people. We have John Smith. He's 14 years old. 
He has asthma. He will be sick. We have James Smith, who's even smaller, but he's fantastic at playing the piano and music. Really world class. We have their mother, who's 38. She's a teacher, but she's having a secret love affair. <laughs> we have the father, who's 42. He's alcoholic. He has no job. But we don't know if he is alcoholic and no job because his wife is having an affair or his wife is having an affair because he's an alcoholic with no job. We don't know which came first. Maybe that's important. Maybe not. <laughs> we have Alan, who is a war hero, sports teacher, and he is the mother's lover. <laughs> we have Paul, who's a scientist. And he's working on medicine, on a cure for AIDS. We have Peter, who owns a factory, and he gives jobs to 500 people. We have Naomi, who's a top model. We have Brenda, she's also a teacher, but she's very overweight. We have Barry, who's a vegetarian, he's a Buddhist, doesn't believe in hurting animals. We have Tara, she's an Olympic swimmer. And we have Patrick, who is the manager, the boss of the mine. In your groups, who will you rescue first, second, and third? And who will you rescue last in your groups? <laughs> now, if you're an intuitionist, maybe you can do case by case. If you're deontological, maybe you want to re rescue women and children and weak people first. If you're teleological, maybe you want to rescue the scientist or the factory owner. I don't know. What kind of thinking will you use? Who will you rescue one, two, three? And who will you rescue last? Go. Give me two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to use deontological. 
And my method is the youngest first. How many people are 16? Nobody. 17? Nobody. 18? You can go. 19? You can go. 20? Sorry, I'm changing it. It's not age anymore. 20, 21, 22, 23. Age is changing. How many people are sick? Is it okay for me to change halfway? Some people would say that's ethical. To do a little bit deontological, a little bit teleological, a little bit right. Other people would say no, it's only ethical to choose one and stay. That's another question that you have to think. So, let's move on to a new topic. Let's look at education. Now, in some countries, the US, Japan, and so on, you have to pay to get a university education. And, especially I see you, you have to pay. Um, I think you guys are something like maybe around this 1.7 million yen a year for your fees, something like this, yeah? In America, Harvard, Yale would be even more money. In many European countries, it's zero, it's free. Some South American countries, some European countries, they think it is not ethical to charge money for education. Education should be for anyone who is intelligent enough to learn, not for people who have the money to pay. Now, an example of this could be if I ask you all to count your money in your wallet, and I choose three people, one, two, three. And I choose these people because today they have the most money. In his wallet, maybe he has 50,000 yen, 40,000 yen, 42,000 yen, for example. Maybe today, in this room, they have the most money. So, they have a lot of money. They can give me 10,000 yen each, and I will give them the answers to the quiz today. Is that ethical? How many people think that's ethical? One? How many people think it's not ethical? But that's the reality of paying for education. They have the money, they can pay to get the answers. If you had 50,000 yen, you could be in this group too. But the reality is, in Japanese society, everybody in this room is in this group. Because either you or your family have this much money to send you to ICU to get the answers. Now, if this was France, for example, or some of the other European countries, you wouldn't pay anything. You would be in this group if you were intelligent enough to be in this group, not because of how much money you have. So there's an ethics involved in education about whether it's ethical to charge money for education or not. This is another thing you need to think about. Even more important is the ethics of health. Now, we have countries like the US where you have to pay a lot of money to see doctors and hospitals and get medicine. We've got countries in South America and Europe where it's free. And we have Japan somewhere in the middle. The Japanese government pays some of the cost. You have to pay 30% of the cost. So, I'm going to show you a short video clip. It's from Michael Moore's Sickle. But it's a short, short clip from the special edition of Sickle Only. And it's about this man who got cancer, who got sick, had money, was paying for the treatment, the money ran out, the treatment stopped, and he died. It's very, very sad. Short clip, but sad. Sense in our feel of what it is to be. One 
nation under God indivisible. Because you want to talk about how our nation's being divided. You can, that's a real easy one between sick, sick people who can't get help, and sick people who can't get help. Now I live in a community where everyone's uninsured. How many people have gotten used to being sick? They don't know what it's like to be in robust health. They just carry on. And they kind of the idea that, well, this is life. You know, I don't know what to say to people that come into the office with their faith broken because they went to the physician and they trusted and the doctor. His first question was not how are you or what can I do to help you, but do you have any money? It's all about money. It's all about money. There was no houses in back. And um, the streets Joe and Andrea Gallegos, um, they're a wonderful, a joyful couple from the parish. They're just two blocks down from us. Hard workers. They have a nice home. They live in a very nice home. About to put another room, a bedroom for, for us now that the kids are getting older and older. And they want their you know, privacy, they want their own rooms and stuff. <laughs> Like so many people in our area, they're barely, barely making their payments. Um, but, but they watch their expenses and, and they hold their breaths. Everything, everything came down when they told me that I had cancer. We turned there and go to Houston. We wanted to put $4,000 down before you walked in the door. So expensive. And we had to pay everything out of pocket. Money to meet doesn't grow on trees. They did some jumping through hoops, and by the grace of God, he did get into uh, the first stages of treatment, which is radiation and chemo. But six months into the treatment, uh, the doctors called me and said that unless Andrea and Joe could come up with $135,000 or $150,000, some enormous amount of money, that they were going to suspend the treatment, even though they weren't finished. And they said, I looked at the guy, I said, you mean, you just stopped these treatments even when they're working? And they said, yeah, unless you can come up with that money, we're not going to do it. People out here are some making minimum wage. Now, people like that worried about life, bills, kids, school, and it doesn't get any easier. This is my second job to help uh, pay for Joe's bills, medical bills. We have to pay uh, for his radiation, they finance that. But we have to pay for his lab work, uh, those monthly installments, office visits, CAT scans. I don't want to see his children. See what that cancer can do to him. And I don't think one hundred thirty thousand dollars is too much to pay for a man's dignity. When people see your story, what do you want them to see? Well, I'm a working man, and everything but. <laughs> now he's uh, he fought all his life. The poor are the blessed of God. The poor are the preferred by the Lord. The 
Lord blesses the nation that takes care of its poor. Todo honor y toda gloria por los siglos de los siglos. If Jesus had had the really bad luck to have been born in South Texas in 2006 as a, as a child of a carpenter and happened to fall down and break his arm, uh, he wouldn't be treated as a human being. He would be treated as a burden to the state. here, um, the Justice book by Michael Sandel provided some of these examples. Um, the second video clip about the guy in Texas was from Sickle. The very short clip um, about the corporate penalties is from a really good movie called The Corporation. Um, the idea for this came from the Shannon articles in your ELA reader. Of course, there's Calvin and Hobbes, and there's a very good website I got online to get all the Simpsons and Family Guy images, and I'll put that link up as well. So there is plenty of further reading there. Now, quiz time. <laughs> 